everybody. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Cupid. I'm your host, Marla Martinson, and today I've got someone all the way from the East Coast. His name is Steve James. Hey, Steve. Hello, Marla. How are you? I love your accent. So, you guys, Steve wrote uh, an amazing book. It's, uh, I would say, memoir. It's about his journey, and it's called Amazing Journey. I read it in one sitting. It was so fascinating because he and I are on the same path. And at the age of 47, Steve had a heart attack that shook him up and set him on a path of uh, changing his life, a spiritual journey. And you know, Steve, what I find so um, interesting is you were a guy who was couldn't even say the word spirit. You know, so <laughs> we're yeah. like an atheist or just thought, you know, woo-woo people were out there. So tell us a little bit about how this heart attack propelled you on your path and what you're up to now. Because you've really, for somebody who didn't believe, you're like out of the <laughs> ballpark in spiritual yeah. adventures now. Well, I'm a type A, so once I get on something, <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> but, um, no, I was, I've been in the car business all my life, running dealerships, training salesmen, closing deals, dealing with the angry service customer, and uh, always kind of a people person. I did that job well because I, I like people inherently, but I like them for the, at that point in my life, I like them from the motivation of, well, I don't want this guy to go out and tell people we have a bad service department, we need to close this deal so this person has to buy the car, you know. It's a whole different motivation, and uh, I was also very fit. I, I was a, a long distance runner. I would run four or five times a week, and that would be me was from three to five miles. Um, I was a five day a week gym rat. I was my perfect weight. I I was in great shape, and I was at the, the top of the food chain in the dealership, and uh, things were going pretty good. And married, beautiful wife, wonderful kids, a nice home here in New Hampshire on a lake. And then uh, one morning at the gym, um, I didn't feel quite right. And so I sat down, and then I started getting real pasty looking. And Long story short, I was having a massive heart attack. And uh, this was after a great workout. I was pushing 70-pound dumbbells. I mean, I was in good shape, you know. So uh, um, they rushed me to the hospital. They told me I was going to die, but I didn't. <laughs> and then after I got... Uh, better from a double bypass, then I got a sternal infection, and that really, really rocked my world. I, I wound up, they wound up debreeding my chest completely because it was infected. Mm -hmm. And the, the bones, the wires, choo, choo, it all went, and I had a huge crevice in my chest, and that was like that for almost two weeks. And every day they would come in and change the bandages, and I was like, you know, pretty upbeat guy, I'm still going to live, you know. And one day it was like, they came in to change the bandages, and I said, so don't bother. I'm done. I'm all the way. And uh, so the nurse said, well, I'm going to go out and close the door, and your only choice really is to either give in or ask for help. Mm -hmm. And I was at a Catholic medical hospital, and there was Jesus hanging off the cross in front of me, you know. She left, and I was, I'm not going to do this, you know. But <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you're, like, almost dying, <laughs> or dying, <laughs> change, you know, and, and the kind of the tough guy persona starts to crumble away. And so I started asking for help. And I did. I had a I had a spiritual experience where I, I got this feeling of um, energy or it's going to be OK. And it kind of restored me. And then when the nurse came in and changed my bandage, then they saw some new growth that they had not seen that they'd been looking for, so the next day they wound up closing me up. And so I kind of got out of the hospital finally. It was, it was another six months with pick lines and another, I had to have another incision because the infection came back. It was, it was, it was quite a journey. That was my first book, Heart Attack and Back. And, and, and it's all about like, what did the doctors say? What did the nurses say? What did your wife say? What did your neighbors say? Because you can't find that book. So I wrote it. And I wanted to know, what was it like for you? You know, right. So I kind of came back to the world with an attitude of well, grateful, thankful. It's just about as far as I went with it. And then over the next, you know, period of a decade or so, I get back to the car business, back to my life. And I, I, I had a different edge. I had a much more compassionate edge, I think, you know, but, you know, slowly you kind of get back to the place that you were. And so then I retired, and it was like, oh, I, I grabbed the brass ring, I got off the merry-go-round, and I, 
And I came home to this house that I love on the lake, and I'm going to play eight ball. I have a eight ball team down at the local, you know. At, at what age did you retire, Steve? Sixty-two. Okay. I said, give me that social. So you security. went back to that life until sixty-two, and then retired. Okay. I did. I did. Yeah. And uh, and my wife, God bless her, she still works. She's doing a part time thing. She's a teacher. So, you know, there was I had I wasn't doing it all by myself for sure. And uh, I was home. I was retired. I was minding my own business. <laughs> and I started hearing a voice in my head. And, of course, at that point, I'm about ready to check myself into Bellevue. I don't know what's going on. This voice is telling me that i got to start meditating. i got to start to learn to meditate. And, and, and let me just ask one quick question. So after that experience talking to Jesus in the hospital and feeling the energy, you still were pretty much an atheist and didn't believe in anything when you went back to your life? I'd say agnostic. I, agnostic. I never looked at atheist. To me, I don't understand atheism. How can you say there's no God? We okay. exist. So. Something, so, but right? still ambivalent about it all. I didn't have it in a box. I didn't okay. sign up with anybody, you know. Okay. And I, yeah. and, it, and it's kind of something that I've, you, you know, you always wonder about. But it, like, I'll, I'll worry about that on the deathbed, you know. Okay. So then you start getting these messages: meditate. <laughs> yeah, I'm, and I'm like having an argument with myself in the living room here one day, all alone. There's nobody home. I'm like, dude, I you got the wrong number. I, I don't meditate. You know, kick <laughs> home somebody else. <laughs> And uh, it just stayed with me and stayed with me. So I found myself ordering a CD online, and then the voice stopped, and that was great. Mm -hmm. And so then I just forgot about it. And about a week and a half after I had the CD, it started again. Put it on. Yeah, Play put it, it on. Buy it, it's not enough. you got to yeah, listen to yeah. it. Yeah. So back came the voice. So now I'm kind of curious. What is going on? What What is happening to me? And so... Um, I listened to the CD, and in the CD, you're going to meet your spirit guide, and, you know, I didn't meet your spirit guides, and I didn't know what was going on. I just sat there, and I listened to the CD. So then I'm like, all right, that's great. I'm like, Now I'm sleepy. I'm going to have a nap, because I can, because I'm retired. So I get in my easy chair, and I crank back, and I close my eyes. And, and as soon as I close my eyes, I realize there's somebody standing right in front of me. Oh, who's standing? So I, and I look. It's my... Best friend, my childhood friend from first grade, his name is Dennis, died at 49 years old of brain cancer right about the time I was recovering from my infection, standing right in front of me, looking like he did in high school, with the same clothes he would have had in high school. And I'm like, Dennis, no way. And you you think, saw him through your third eye because your eyes were closed? I, I realize now that my eyes were closed, okay. but at that moment, it was just as real as he was standing in front of me. Okay. Anyways, long story short, he floated down and gave me a hug because I couldn't get up, and he smiled at me, and I opened my eyes. He was gone, and I was like, all right, well, what's that all about? <laughs> you know, it's like, guys, you know, your voice is in my head, man. And that's sort of what happened, and it just slowly but surely it turned into this whole this whole thing. And the more I get into it, I finally went back online, and I found a circle down in Massachusetts. And I, went and I sat in that circle, and I had some very intense experiences when I first started in the in that circle. And uh, but as I as I went along with this sort of energy that was pushing me in this direction. Um, new things would happen. Doors would open. I was meeting. I was meeting some incredible people, mm -hmm. and uh, and I, I started to feel happy about it, which was weird, you know. And uh, and, and just, tell and tell everybody you said when you first sat in that circle, like the woman said, "Spirit," and you couldn't even say that, you know, like you. I mean, I was afraid that, you know, I mean, driving to this circle for the first time, at halfway there, I had a panic attack. And I'm like, what is happening to me? I'm going to go sit in a room with a bunch of, you know, older ladies, probably. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I hang with guys, you know, like, and, but, and we're going to meditate, I guess. And I'm, I felt like I was like losing my mind. And I, I panicked a little bit, but then I, it, it slowly it, it went away. And so then I got there and I went in and I sat down. And and, I'm, and this wonderful, wonderful gal, Jerry, uh, Jerry Shanti Simone, she goes by, and she's just a phenomenal person. 
oh, 15 years earlier, the same thing had sort of happened to her, you know. So uh, she's seen a lot of people like myself come in and sit down and not know why we're there. And there seems to be like a groundswell of this happening. I meet people all the time, which is what the book is really for, because I would have loved at that point to get my hands on a book like this. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. So other people are experiencing this stuff, too. You know? and so, so like sitting in a circle is sort of like, I, I imagine going to an AA meeting, you know, it's like, I am Steve, and I need to see dead people. You know, <laughs> you want to be with like-minded people because right. you can't talk about this stuff. Uh, you know, my wife now knows everything that's happened, but but initially I was kind of like keeping it on the DL because I didn't want her to think, "Man, he's finally cracked." <laughs> right. My husband often said, "You know, are you losing your mind? Do you hear voices? Are you there's no angels? What are you talking about?" And still, yeah. he's opened up more, but still says. Look, 9.999%, I still don't believe in angels, but I'd like to see one, you know, so he's like um, supporting me now in what I do, but still can't wrap his mind around it. So I know what you you mean. It's, it's, uh... I think that's common. You know, it's, I, I talk to lots of people in circles whose spouses are not understanding it. And, you know, and if you don't have some foundation there, it could probably break up a relationship, you know. Right, right. And it's good to have like-minded friends, at least. Even if our spouses aren't on board totally, we can go to those circles or go hang with those friends and talk about it. And so you, this book, like my, my book that will be coming out, you guys, The Buddha Made Me Do It, it's the reason I connected with Steve so much is we both, he just, his book just came out, mine's going to come out, and it, they, our books chronicle our spiritual journey, how all this unfoldment happened. And so you really got into everything. Tell us about the spoon bending because you go all the way to, I mean, now you're and working with this powerful energy. So tell us about the energy healing and the energy that you work with and the spoon bending. So we want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, so af after a while, um, what got me into the energy was I had a very, very severe uh, shoulder injury. And it had it for a long time. And, it, you know, it was a six or eight ibuprofen a night to get to sleep type of an injury. And I met this fellow sitting in a circle who everybody said was, was, was a healer. And I'm like, oh, all right. You know, I'm taking it all with a grain of salt, but I'm not really believing it. But one day the pain was really bad, and I was got paired up with him in an exercise in a circle that we were doing uh, psychic development exercises which I was trying to be open to. And, and anyways, I said to him, I said, his name was Fred. I said, hey, Fred, you want to take a whack at my shoulder there? It's, you know, I've got some pain there. And I, I didn't know how to approach these people. I mean, what do you say? Hey, I want your healing. <laughs> Put your hands on me, man. <laughs> so uh, anyways, he goes, oh, oh, sure. I mean, to him it was like, you know, hey, would you put some butter on this piece of toast? Oh, yeah. You know, I said, so he stands behind me and he scans my shoulder like this with his hand. And he says, oh, he says, you have nerve damage from here to here. And I said, yeah, that's exactly right. I can't, like, maybe like this, you know. So he says to me, he goes, I want you to locate that pain in your mind. And I want, I'm going to pull it out with my hand. And I want you to push it out with your mind. See it as some form of energy. Push out. What have I got to lose? It hurts. It already hurts. It's not going to be any worse. I said, okay, so I closed my eyes and I envisioned, I tried to put my awareness to my shoulder and I envisioned a red ball of pain and in my mind I pushed it out and as I started doing this, he goes, oh good, here it comes. And I'm like, okay, keep pushing, you know, like I was giving birth, keep pushing, right? Not that I know about that. Anyway, so I, I pushed it out and he goes, oh good, I got it, it's all out. And he goes, all right, he says, try your shoulder. And I'm like, oh boy, this is the disappointing part, right? Right. I go, I'm like, what? Now, that was years ago. There it is still. <laughs> yeah. Now, I was taking 20-pound dumbbells on the bench, just like barely able to press them with this arm. Mm -hmm. This arm was strong. The next morning, I went to the gym, and I have a workout partner, and I said, let me have those 30-pound dumbbells. And her name is Cheryl. I work out with a woman. Don't ask me why. And um, so she goes, what's this? What's up with this? You haven't been able to use these in years, you know? 12 reps, just as easy as five. Uh -huh. Now, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do at that point? You know, you got to come to terms with, with something happened there. And, and it kind of uh, 
sort of made me a believer. And so now, and and I think what happens is you have those experiences, and there's no coincidences. And that experience was one way or another was sort of planned for me because it opened my left-hand side of my mind up to new possibilities. And I think that's what life is a lot about, is it's being open to new possibilities and mm-hmm. being able to align ourselves to the possibility that something new will happen and call it into our lives. And now you, did you, you train for some energy work too, to, to do? There's, well, it's, that, that, then I wanted, well, I want to do that, right? right. <laughs> then I wound up taking Reiki, mm-hmm. and I wound up taking the Melchizedek method of healing, which is very powerful and beautiful work. And then I met a fellow from the West Coast, Gene Eng, uh, Dr. Gene Eng. Uh, he's a uh, PhD quantum physicist and a neurobiologist, and a wonderful, wonderful man. And he works with the Octorian energy, which are spiritual beings that have come to him, and he has this whole healing method. But one of the things that, that he introduced me to is spoon bending. And it's like, why? What's that all about, you know? And I, I had always thought it was kind of what I would call a showboat type of mm-hmm. situation, and nothing that I was really interested in. And my sister called me one night. Uh, she lives nearby, and she's been on a Buddhist path for some time, so she likes the meditation stuff. And she said, hey, they're having this thing down in Andover, um, spoon bending, you know, and I'd like to go, and I want you to go with me. And I'm like, sis, come on. This is, like, come, this is, you know, really hokey. Now we're really we're going off the fringe, you know. I really want to go, and I'm surprised that you would blah, blah, blah. She's like, all right, sis, fine. Well, I wasn't there for 10 minutes, and I was totally captivated. What Gene teaches is 10 techniques, which I have learned, and I now, I now teach them also. I do workshops. Saturday night, I was at a company party showing people how to bend forks. We actually bend forks because it's more fun to get the tines than that. But um, it's 10 techniques to bring energy in through your body with your consciousness and charge a piece of stainless steel, hard stainless steel, with um, an energy charge that you then give the intention to bend. So what are we doing? We're taking energy, we're bringing it in through our body, we're using our bodies as a conduit, which is Reiki, um, and you're charging the fork, and then you're giving the energy the intention to bend. And you be holding this really, really hard fork, and you just kind of like, like, listen, no. I'm at the point now because in my mind, I see what a fork should look like. It should have a loop in it, and the tines should be all twisted up. That's and what this is alchemy, is. isn't it? Would you call this alchemy or no? You know, I probably. I, I've never studied I, I don't know, but, and, but you said it gets so soft that you can just tie it in a knot. Do a loop like that, and then it hardens back up again, and you can't move it. <laughs> what the science, you know, the quantum physicists that are studying these nano sciences that are, uh, this is CERN over in Europe where they've got the big track where they're smashing the particles into each other and everything, yeah, yeah. they're finding out that everything that, like the Buddhists have said for years, we're all one. But what does that mean? Well, it turns out we actually, the, the, the scientists are saying, oh, my God, guess what? Everything is energy. We're all connected. Oh, these guys are right. <laughs> and they're finding this stuff out. And one of the things that they're finding out also is that we're multidimensional beings. And, for example, the pig's boson that they discovered a few years ago, it can be here and here at the same time. The what? The Higgs boson. Higgs boson. Yeah, now, a few years ago, a fellow named Higgs won the Nobel Peace Prize for discovering and proving the existence that Einstein had theorized of a boson, which is the very smallest particle they can find. And the interesting thing is that that particle is made out of energy and a frequency. Mm -hmm. When the energy and the frequency join, they form this particle. And this particle can be in two places at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... It, it, it's like proves the multidimensionality of it all. Now, the spoon bending, where this applies to the spoon bending is that um, some scientists did a, uh, an experiment where they shot balls of steel into a wall. Now, they weighed the balls before they fired them, and then right after impact, they weighed them. And they weighed slightly less after impact. Mm-hmm. 
And then slowly they regain their weight um, after about six seconds. And what the scientists theorize is that because of the nature of the impact, we actually knock some of the molecules out of the metal into another dimension. Mm -hmm. But they can't stay there, so they have to return. Well, this kind of makes sense with the spoon bending. We take the energy, and, and the force of the energy knocks some of these particles out, and the fork gets very soft, and you feel it. That's the whole thing is to feel the softness of the metal. And then after four to six seconds, it firms back up again. Yeah. So it's kind of uh, a way, again, to take introduce to the left-hand side of your mind that the things that the right-hand side of your mind will accept might be true. Mm -hmm. And uh, so once you've done it, you have to deal with it. Once again, it's like it's like having your shoulder fixed, and you have to deal with it. Fantastic. You know? And so now you've taken uh, your life to a, you know, you've, you're, you're, you were tired, and now you're doing energy healings, spoon-bending workshops, and this is a full-time thing for you, right? Not full-time. I don't ever want it to be full time. <laughs> I have other interests. A full time passion. <laughs> but it's a full time passion, and like uh, this morning, I um, I had an office of my own um, up, uh, a few towns over uh, up until November, and it just uh, what I've learned is to um, access my my knowing. We we have this knowing that is different from our thinking, mm -hmm. and it's in our energy fields, and we can learn to access it. And around the end of November, it it occurred to me that. That had come to a close. I closed the office, and I took the month of December off. And in the back of my head, I just knew that in January, all these new doors were going to open for me. Well, the book is one of them. But January 1st, I start getting phone calls. They want to hire you at this company, Piney to Bend Spoons. I want you to come to a spoon bending workshop. I, it just I've got like a half a dozen gigs. And this morning, I just went over to the next town over and led a meditation group for a new group of people who wanted me to do that. And so I do that. I'm a meditation instructor as well. And so, you know, I do the uh, do the energy healing. I do distance healing. I was sending you some calming energy this afternoon because you had said this morning you were a little bit. Uh, uh, matchmaking can be a little unnerving <laughs> and challenging sometimes. So when we talked earlier, I was like, ah, I need something. You know, I wanted a drink, a stiff drink, but I don't drink. And I said, nope, not going to do it. I'm going to make myself a nice cup of tea, and then Steve sent me some calming energy. I saged my my space here, saged myself, said some yeah. prayers, and I'm in a lot better frame of mind right now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And, and one of the things that I've learned, too, is that uh, when I start to get edgy and I start to get angry and everything, I, I've, I've learned through a series of exercises to try and connect to our higher self. Because our higher self never gets mad. Higher self isn't judgmental. Higher self isn't angry. It's not, you know, scared. It's not afraid. It doesn't care what you think. Because higher self will never give away its power to you. And when we're afraid of what somebody thinks about us, our image, our statements, or whatever, it's because we're then giving them our authority to, you know, to do that. And so higher self doesn't do that. And it's a simple thing. I just... Um, Paul Selig, who you interviewed and who uh, I've been studying his, his books, it's just a simple matter of saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, and call that, let that energy fall in your higher frequency and align to it and consciously say, I'm, I'm aligning to this. And for me, I get an a sen immediate sensation of chill down. Just chill. Everything is good. Yeah, and Paul Selig, you guys, is an amazing channel, and he channels... Uh, a group of guides. I will put the link below to his interview too that I did and that's how Steve and I met because Steve commented on that video and then we connected and we're both uh, students of the guides and Paul and I'm going to a workshop uh, at the end of this month uh, with Paul and the guides and I'm so excited to feel that Hello. frequency and that energy and Steve you've taken the uh, workshop with him as well right <laughs> three times oh my gosh yeah. so that's awesome. Well, well last time he was out Way. I was able. I got. I was recruited to be his chauffeur. Oh, yeah, and he's yeah. East Coast. He's in New York City, so you're not yeah. so far. But yeah, but it, it was great. So I got to spend two days with him, and just uh, awesome. I, I can't wait, Steve. Uh, thank you so much for popping in and talking about your sure. new book. And uh, everybody, Thanks, peace and love. Bye. Peace out.